Welcome um, to this second session and greetings here from South Africa. So for this uh, uh, second session, we'll have a very interesting talk and each speaker will have 15 to 18 minutes to present and uh, we'll dedicate five to three minutes uh, questions at the end. So uh, feel free to post a chat, uh, to post a question in the chat or raise, a, raise your hand at the end of each presentation. Okay, so our first speaker is Jonas Olson from Linchop University from Sweden, and he'll be speaking about uh, the work on automating the planning of container loading for Atlas Scope Co, coping with real life stacking and stability constraints. Okay, so Jonas, over to you. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay. Can you let me know if you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jonas Olsson, and um, I'm going to present an industrial container loading problem that I worked on together with Tobian Larsson and uh, Nils Hassan Kotejne from uh, Linköping University in uh, Sweden. So I studied in Linköping, but since about three years, I'm based in London working as an engineer for a global logistics company. So this project was for a company named Atlas Copco and took place in 2015 to 2016 at a distribution center in Dallas, Texas. So a note here is that the part of the company is now a separate entity named Epiroc. So this DC in Dallas ships uh, spare parts for drilling equipment. Due to the nature of the business, there's a large variety of packages, which makes loading containers challenging. A single package may contain one or multiple items, and there are also larger packages that can hold several smaller ones. Such packages are called consolidation pallets. It's either an open box on a pallet or a pallet wrapped in plastic. And packages and consolidation pallets are loaded in a 20 foot or 40 foot ocean shipping container. So prior to our solution, manual load planning of ocean containers involved a test loading on the warehouse floor. So this was to predict if the container would be full enough, considering the freight cost, but also to ensure that all packages would fit while avoiding risk of cargo damage. So this was a time-consuming trial and error process, which caused excessive labor usage and delays in ordering containers. So the desire was to eliminate this test loading process, and that's what triggered our project. And here we have some examples of uh, loaded containers at the loading docks. And an important enabler to automate the load planning was the laptops in the forklifts that could be used to display step-by-step -step load plans. And this is an example of five placement in a load plan, the blue indicating the next placement to be made by the operator. And the bottom right, you have a picture of uh, what the load plan looks at that stage. So after that introduction, I'll continue with a problem definition. So this illustration shows an overview of the packing and loading process at the DC. So packages from level one and two are input to a loading problem. And consolidation pallets and shipping containers at level three and four our output from our loading problem. So now shifting focus a bit from the uh, practical context at the DC to the academic literature, uh, our problem have several special characteristics compared to the existing literature. So one is that it's neither a pure output maximization nor pure input minimization problem uh, in the sense that packages are given and expected to fit into a single container. And we have multiple goals for loading to achieve load plan quality uh, other than the utilization. The pro second is that the problem is highly constrained. So seven out of 10 categories of constrained constraints uh, from one of the reviews uh, are applicable. So in this review, only two out of 163 papers had seven, and there were none with more than seven. And it's also highly constrained in the sense that it requires a much more realistic modeling of uh, stacking constraints. So in our case, we consider that a package can withstand a higher pressure uh, on the edges 
than in the center of its top surface. And finally, uh, fourth, is that the problem is heterogeneous and in, in two ways. So one is that the number of sizes of packages is large, um, and also that packages have 10 attributes in addition to size. So two recent uh, reviews uh, support why our work would be relevant. So one review from 2016 expressed the lack of work with many real-world constraints, which uh, our work has. And uh, a review from 2013 highlighted the prospect of tackling soft constraints with multi-objective approaches, which links to our goals for load plan quality. So we can define our problem uh, as to maximize fulfillment of four main goals. Goal one is related to fit all the packages, and goals two, three, and four uh, relates to other aspects that contribute to load plan quality. Goal two is about horizontal cargo stability, goal three about container stability, and goal four to avoid awkward placements. And the goal fulfillment is with respect to some hard constraints. We both have the uh, standard geometry and orientation hard constraints but also some hard constraints for stacking, positioning, and vertical stability. So next, I will talk about the first key aspect of our approach. So regarding this concept of uh, stages of loading, uh, there are similar ideas in the literature. So one set of authors had a grouping procedure followed by a packing procedure, and uh, Another author couple had a two-stage procedure. And also, uh, stage of loading makes sense in practice because it mimics how the DC operators plan and perform loading manually. And it allows for various goals and constraints for different stages of the loading, which helps to come up with feasible load plans. So in our case, we have a four-stage procedure. In uh, stage one, large and heavy packages are placed into the shipping containers. In stage two, we predetermine placements of consolidation pallets. In stage three, small and light packages are placed onto consolidation pallets. In stage four, the consolidation pallets and remaining packages are placed into the shipping containers. So a couple of notes here is that all boxes are assigned a priori to either stage one, three, or four. And a really great thing about this is that the same method can be used to solve each stage, just with some minor modifications in between. So I'll continue with the second key aspect or approach, which is this method that we use to solve each of the four stages. Our choice of approach back in 2015 was partly guided by this review from 2013, which stated that uh, metaheuristics would be the most suitable for solving container loaded problems in practice in the foreseeable future. And some characteristics here of our approach. So one is that the goals and the hard constraints were not well defined in the early stages of our work. So this required some flexibility with respect to quickly adding and altering these. Second is this scoring function for box placements and the use of a genetic algorithm for tuning uh, coefficients in the scoring function. And this is heavily based on our work from 2004. And another key aspect is the components of a scoring function that contributes to feasible load plans. And some of our uh, components were inspired by two works, one from 2010 and one from 2009. Uh, but we also developed many of our own components from uh, just the testing and, and crafting. So this method that we have, uh, we call it a two-level metaheuristic approach. So a key concept of that is a steering mechanism, which is to impact a global objective, in this case, load plan goals, by making local priorities through a placement scoring. And the idea is that these local priorities are tuned to become consistent with the global obje objective. Or in other words, 
the placement scoring is tuned to become consistent with the load plan goals. On the lower level, we have a constructive heuristic with scoring function for greedy placements. And on the upper level, we tune this scoring function for the constructive heuristic using a genetic algorithm for the tuning. And this illustration to the left uh, shows the, the overall algorithm. So you start by a genetic algorithm where we initialize a population. And this population W, uh, which corresponds to uh, coefficients for the scoring function, this population W is sent into uh, the placement heuristic. And for each individual in the population, we generate a load plan. This uh, set of load plans, L, is then sent into the load plan evaluation. And for each individual in the population, we evaluate uh, the load plan. And uh, this results in a set of fitness values. So one, one fitness for, for every individual, which is then sent back into the genetic algorithm where we update the population based on those fitness values. And we run this uh, loop for every generation of the genetic algorithm. So some notes on this is that uh, a gene J of an individual, individual I in the population corresponds to, uh, to a coefficient in the placement scoring function. And this scoring function for placement K is a weighted sum. We see those scoring coefficients and the different components. And notice that the placement heuristic uh, is deterministic. So the only randomness here is from the genetic algorithm. And finally, uh, the fitness of an individual in the population is made up of these different measures uh, for goal components for a load plan. And just to make it a little bit more concrete, here are just a few examples of uh, fitness components. Uh, so, so, for example, the first component uh, is a binary variable that is 1 if there are no leftover boxes for the load plan and 0 otherwise. And uh, some components are applicable to all stages, uh, while others are only applicable to selected stages. And here are some examples of uh, scoring components in the placement heuristic. So same thing here, uh, some are applicable to all stages, while others are applicable only to selected stages. And another note is that the, uh, we use dynamic uh, sequencing uh, rather than static sequencing, meaning that the choice of which box to place next may depend on uh, previous placements, uh, which is the case for some of these components. And um, a key aspect for this kind of uh, constructive heuristic is how to generate placement points. So we consider placements as box orientation container point. And we use uh, like the standard normal points and projected points, but also what we call adjusted duplicate points, which is something we came up with during the development work. So I'm now done with the approach, and we'll move on to some uh, results and analysis. So comparison with uh, algorithms from the existing literature was not possible, unfortunately, due to unique uh, characteristics of our problem. Uh, but we wanted to still verify that features of, all, of our algorithm are needed. So we focused on these three features the genetic algorithm tuning of the scoring weights versus using fixed weights, the components in the placement scoring function, and the use of these adjusted duplicate points. And we tested this on 50 real shipments at the DC. And here we're reporting only on the stage one results, since it's by far the most uh, crucial and challenging for the overall load plan. And, and we're making 10 runs for each of the 50 problems with uh, 200 generations in each run. So here we're seeing some results for different versions of, of the algorithm. 
so version 22 to the far right is the one implemented at the DC and versions 1 to 21 are simplifications of this. So in this table uh, the upper rows indicate uh, the settings uh, that are used and the two last rows indicate how good uh, these settings turn out to be. So what we found here is that version 22, uh, the one implemented, is uh, best in terms of fitting all packages. So it succeeds in 493 out of 500 runs. Version 21 turned out to be slightly better than 22 with respect to average uh, fitness value. But for one of the instances, it never succeeds in fitting all the packages. And overall, what we found from this exercise was that the uh, genetic algorithm tuning of the scoring weights is really essential for the method to be good. Uh, and that the sco our particular scoring components and the use of the uh, adjusted duplicate points uh, are also helpful to fit all the packages uh, for the most difficult uh, instances. So I'll ch say something quick about uh, implementation. So the software that resulted from this was used for two, two years at the DC in Allen, Texas. So it was capable of generating uh, satisfactory load plans within acceptable computation times. And it had the ability for the user to interrupt the optimization whenever satisfied uh, with, with the best available load plan currently. And this did help to eliminate the need for, for test loading, which was kind of what triggered the project. <clears throat> so finally, in conclusion, so this work was recently published in the European Journal of Operational Research. And what we have here is a solution approach for container loading problems with uh, several practical constraints and or uh, more objectives than, than just volume utilization. So our work, we call it a two-level metaheuristic method. And the idea is to impact a global objective, which is the low plan goals, by making local priorities uh, via placement scoring. So we're, these local priorities are tuned to become consistent with the global objecti objective. Or in other words, uh, the placement scoring is tuned to become consistent with the low plan goals. And in the lower level, we have a constructive heuristic with a scoring function for greedy placements. And on the upper level, we tune this uh, scoring function for the constructive heuristic. And we use a genetic algorithm for the tuning. And as a final note, uh, these previous reviews mentioned a need for data sets with real world constraints. So we have these 50 real-world test problem data sets included as a CSV file in our supplementary material. So hopefully, in the future, this will be useful for, for someone. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all I had. So just time for any questions. Okay, thanks so much, Anas, for the interesting talk. Um, any question from the audience? Yeah, I have a question, if I may. Yes. Okay, yes. So uh, I wanted to know how you, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the interesting uh, talk. Uh, how you generate the uh, adjusted uh, duplicate points, if I... Yeah, let me... So I saw the picture, but probably, yeah, yeah, here. So the, uh, the forward adjusted duplicate points, so the reason why we generate them uh, is for the stacking constraints, because uh, in the example here, uh, let's see if you can see my mouse, uh, in this one here, yeah. by moving, by placing a potential box at that location, okay. uh, it would be supported in uh, by the edges of the package below. So simply what we would do is for every uh, remaining potential uh, box, we oh, would look okay. at where would the point be located so that it would gain support uh, from the edges. I see, I see, okay. Yeah. And, and in this other case, this is more just for the purpose of utilization. So we would take we would have a, an, let's say, a normal point here, and then we would look at the different uh, boxes that are remaining, and we would shift the point uh, diagonally uh, so that a package could, uh, a box could perfectly be snugged uh, without the intersection with the, the the walls of the container. Yeah, very good. And another curiosity, just very quick, um, about the running time. I mean, how long does it take normally for, uh, on average, for an instance that you try? So 
it, it varies a lot between instances. Uh, and there are a few, really, what's, what's driving the time is a few components that are quite expensive in terms of runtime. Uh, but in the paper uh, that we have for all these 50 problems, the, uh, the runtime per uh, generation, okay. uh, which I, th I think in some cases could be just a few seconds, and in some cases maybe uh, half a minute. But that would depend also on, on the settings of the genetic algorithm. Uh, but when, when this was being used, uh, for, some, for, for some instances, uh, they could get a load plan in a matter of minutes. And in other cases, maybe they'll let it run for, for an hour uh, to, to get a solution. So, uh, but it wasn't a setting where, where an hour runtime would be acceptable. But again, it's very much based on uh, the, how expensive these, the calculations for the constraints and the components uh, are. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, the last question from Julia. Thank you, um, and thank you for the talk. I'm interested uh, about the, you, you said that it wasn't a traditional objective because um, you knew that all of the boxes would fit in the, into the container, so you didn't have to worry about either maximizing profit or minimizing waste. I'm interested how the company, you know, worked out that everything could fit in and whether it was ever at all quite tight and you were generating solutions which actually couldn't fit inside the container. So, so yeah, that, that plays into how, how they used it. So they had a user interface where as new orders would come in, they, they would have select like the current set of orders and they would expect them to be able to go, to go into the next shipment. And they would run that and if it, everything fit and they were happy with it, they would send off that container and move on to the next one. So the user would work with uh, whatever orders and corresponding ship uh, packages they had available. But if they would end up choosing um, a set of packages that didn't fit, even letting the, the, the optimization software run, uh, they would maybe remove uh, maybe the last order and try to run it again. So that's kind of how the user interacted with the software. Great, thank you. All right, thanks again, Jonas. Uh, now we'll move to the second uh, presentation. The second speaker is myself, um, Georgina. Let me share my screen. Um, I hope you can see my screen, yeah. Uh, from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. So I'll be talking about my uh, recent work and it's still an ongoing uh, research. Um, on the development of framework for uh, predicting strip packing algorithm performance. Is it working? Can I it? Okay. Um, all of us know uh, in this uh, working group uh, that over the past uh, few years, we focused mainly on the development of fast and effective packing algorithms to solve packing problems. And we published various uh, experimental studies uh, demonstra demonstrating the effectiveness of our new algorithms in comparison of uh, the previously published approaches. And the popular use of benchmark libraries, such as the repository of ACCAP, helps us to standardize the comparison, uh, the evaluation of those algorithms. However, um, assessment of packing algorithm per performance uh, is uh, difficult when the condition, when the conclusions depends on the chosen test distances. And there is a risk that um, algorithms are developed such a way that they perform well on the chosen instances without understanding the effect of the characteristics on the performance of the algorithms. And moreover, there is also a that this requires some and the rich um, algorithm can be expected to succeed or fail with respect to a given instance space. And also there is no adequate method for selecting the most appropriate algorithm to solve um, an instance. But yet, I think for the advancement of the field, it is essential to address uh, such research gap. And essentially, I think it's important to address these questions. Uh, like which algorithm is likely to be best for a relevant set of problem instances, on which type of instances does an algorithm what perform its competitors and why, and how can we describe those instances? 
And I think answers to these questions help us to understand the conditions under which a particular parking algorithm can be expected to succeed or fall with respect to the features of benchmark instances, and that help us to develop improved algorithm designs. Also, answers to these questions help us to uncover the relationships between characteristics of problem instances and algorithm performance, and this helps us to develop uh, models capable of predicting the best algorithm for uh, the new uh, instance. So this work basically attempts to address these questions. So more precisely, the objectives of the work are to propose methodology for characterizing parking algorithm performance based on critical features of parking instances, and then identify the best performing algorithm for a given instance, and then reveal some sort of insights into the relative power um, of algorithms with respect to the instance. <laughs> So, uh, so basically the work uh, attempts to develop tools capable of modeling the relationship between instances characteristics and algorithm performance, and also for an automated parking algorithm selection. So the proposed framework uh, in this work is shown here. It consists of uh, three phases. The first phase, the training phase, involves uh, various steps as depicted by the dash arrow in this uh, diagram on top here. So basically it's a process whereby instances are selected, the features are calculated, and a set of optimal features is generated to model the relationship between uh, instance characteristics and algorithm performance. And then the second phase, the prediction phase, is depicted by the uh, solid arrows on the top left here. So based on the feature and instance spaces obtained from the first phase, then one can use machine learning techniques such as cluster analysis, classification, classification techniques to classify the group of instances where an algorithm is predicted to perform well or poorly, and also to identify which algorithm is recommended for which um, areas in the instance space. And finally, the last phase, the feedback phase, is depicted by the dotted arrows at the bottom here. It's a process whereby the accuracy of the prediction model is assessed. And also during this process, the relative strengths and weaknesses of which algorithm is measured across the instance space um, such that one can reveal the, the, the uh, relative power of the uh, various algorithms uh, under consideration. And I've applied this uh, framework uh, as a case study on the two-dimensional street parking problem. So as we all know, the two-dimensional street parking problem can be defined as follows. So we have a set of n rectangular items, each having fixed dimensions, and uh, we have also a strip. Then the objective is to minimize the total parking head such that all the terms are parked uh, without overlapping. And then uh, we assume, uh, I assume that uh, we have orthogonal parking and we fixed orientation. So uh, I applied the framework for this uh, type of uh, parking problem. So I will show you the step, uh, the, the test of the steps of the framework. So the first one is the instance generation one. So a total of 3,398 instances is considered in this work, where the first set, uh, 1,700 was obtained from the literature, and the remaining one uh, have generated a new set of 1,680 from uh, using the, the CPAC uh, gen program generator of uh, Silva et al, um, 2014. So that's the instances that I've considered. Then for the feature selection, um, in 2019, there is a paper of Junior um, et al. Uh, in which they attempted to use uh, uh, machine learning to uh, characterize this strip packing, the two-dimensional strip packing uh, problem. So they consider 56 descriptive variables. And then after the analysis, they realized that uh, these variables can be reduced to 19 characteristics 
to uh, describe the problem instances. But in this work, I've considered uh, uh, 10 characteristics in order to uh, avoid redundancy. So it consists of four descriptive variables where two of them um, have, have a four components each. And those four descriptive variables are given here. So the first one is aspect ratio, area ratio, the heterogeneity ratio, and width through ratio. I'm not sure if I can see the whole screen. Okay. So, and then for the aspect ratio and area ratio, I've, continue, I've continue, considered four um, components, the maximum, minimum, mean, and variance. Okay, and then, yeah, just note that the aspect ratio uh, variables uh, help to um, uh, give information on the shape of the items in the instances. Like if, it's, if the items are of rectangular shape or square shape, the area ratio help to gain information on the size of all at times, like if it's wide or narrow, and the heterogeneity ratio um, give information on the variety of the times and with ratio on the type of all items. Okay, so that's the features that I've considered um, uh, for this work. Then the next step, uh, the performance evaluation. I've uh, considered these seven recently published um, algorithms to evaluate uh, uh, the various instances to get uh, uh, the performance of the algorithm. So ranging from 2011 until 2020, so they were uh, reported as among the best algorithms to solve uh, the two-dimensional street parking problems. Then we can see here on the table, um, the best algorithms that solve uh, each of the problem instances this is just example. So uh, I define a set of best algorithms uh, in a way that the performance ratio of any pair of algorithms in the set are equal to almost 1%. So that means, for example, for this second uh, case here, this uh, second row here, the SRA and hybrid J A algorithms uh, perform uh, significantly the same to solve uh, the, this instance uh, of Hopper here. So they are considered as the best algorithm to solve that instance and so on. Okay, so given that, so I've, I have the best algorithm to solve each of the problem instances that I consider. And then the next step, um, I performed the caster analysis. So I randomly selected 2,270 training instances from the entire instances that I'm considering. And according to the analysis, the number of cluster is four. And then I use k-means to cluster the instances. And here we have the, in this table uh, that captures the best algorithm associated to each of the cluster. So for instances belonging to cluster one, uh, according to my analysis, I, the, the algorithm uh, AM is the best algorithm to solve instances in that cluster and so on. And so and then I uh, performed the cluster, um, sorry, the classification, uh, classification analysis. So to um, create the classification rules, use the 10 features as independent variables to generate the corresponding clusters and the best algorithm associated to each cluster as, uh, are used as class variables. And then use the decision tree algorithm to perform the classification um, process. So once this is done, then we, uh, I proceed with the algorithm prediction, uh, which uh, was performed on the remaining 1001 to test instances. So here in this table, it captures the results that, obtain, that I, I have obtained. So in the first column have the name of the instances. In the second uh, column, I uh, have the real best algorithms. These are the algorithms uh, obtained uh, by solving directly the instances uh, using the, the the algorithms, the set of the seven algorithms that they considered. And then in the third column, I have the predicted best algorithm using the uh, classification uh, rules that uh, performed in the previous step. 
And then in terms of validation, I compare the predicted algorithm with the real best algorithm. So the, the result for that is uh, captured in the last column in the table, uh, the March one. So in case the two columns, the real best algorithms and the predicted best algorithm matches, then uh, it means that the prediction is correct and uh, I send the value of equal to one for the match column. And in case the predicted best algorithm does not match the real best one, then it's equal to zero. Then the, the result uh, indicates that I've got an accuracy of 81% of um, correctly uh, predicting the best algorithm for the test uh, instances. All right, and then, so that's for the prediction model. Then the last uh, step is the analysis of algorithm power. So here on the first plot on the left, we have the dimensional plot of all instances considered in this work. And then in the plot on the right, we've got what I called hard instances. So these hard instances are instances that are uniquely solved by one of the algorithms, which means that only one algorithm performed best for each of these instances. And what I found interesting uh, is that, is that, that uh, among these hard instances, um, I discover a well a separated relative power or performance of two algorithms, the hybrid genetic algorithm and the IAM uh, algorithm. So you can see here on the plot on the left, the red colored instances on the left plot, these instances were uniquely solved by the hybrid genetic algorithm. And the red colored instances on the right, these uh, instances were uniquely solved by the IAM um, algorithm. And I think this, uh, it's interesting to see this uh, type of separation so that we can see the weaknesses or the strength of the algorithm. And as I said earlier, this is still an ongoing research. So I still need to figure out to find out why and how these instances were uniquely solved by these um, uh, algorithms. So as summary, uh, as insights and future direction. So it looks like the methodology achieved 81% um, uh, accuracy in correctly predicting the best performing algorithm for a new instance. But I think that's good in terms of accuracy, but one can still improve that um, performance accuracy, maybe by considering more um, problem instances and also maybe refining the characteristics implode or the features implode to um, characterize the various uh, instances. And secondly, the majority of the instances incorrectly classified are TED results. So in fact, I defined uh, a best algorithm. I assigned a best algorithm to each cluster, and it was assumed that the best algorithm um, is an algorithm with performance measure relatively 1% higher than the others. And if there is case of ties, then I random randomly choose one, uh, one of the best algorithm. But however, it looks like sometimes the assigned algorithm uh, may perform best for a specific instance of other clusters. So maybe a robust condition may be needed to uh, avoid biased prediction and also to improve the performance accuracy. And finally, uh, the methodology is able to identify the regions of instance space where algorithms have unique strengths and weaknesses. And as I said earlier, um, I still need to figure out um, uh, to conduct further tests and to maybe hopefully provide some sort of recommendation to see like what type of instances a particular algorithms would um, work best. Okay, so I think that's, that's it for my talk and um, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. So if I may ask a quick question, just out of uh, yes. curiosity. Uh, so you said that it's still ongoing, the research, right, in the beginning? Uh, 
Uh, what are you working on now? Are you trying to uh, feed the model with new instances in order to improve the accuracy or uh, something else? Uh, at the moment, I'm more um, focusing on the last case, on the analysis of uh, the relative power of the algorithms to see the relation between the algorithm performance and the characteristic of the instance space. So still, and then after that, when I have like a better idea of what's going on there, then uh, move uh, to the case of um, improving the accuracy of the prediction model. Because I think 81% is still good at the moment. Yeah. So, but, but, but I still need to conduct further tests and see what's going on if I consider many uh, other instances of other characteristics. Great, thank you. All right, so um, I think Alvaro and then Jose. Hello, Josefine. First of all, thank you very much for our presentation. It uh, was very interesting to see the uh, applications of uh, uh, heuristics and uh, data mining together in the same study. Uh, why the rectangles rotation was not considered in your study? Uh, sorry, why? Sorry, I the, the... the items rotation, uh, you not consider oh. as a constraint of uh, your problem. Uh, why? Uh, uh, okay, thanks for the question. This is just for simplicity purpose now, just to test the uh, um, effectiveness of the model. But definitely later on when, when it's working, then one can apply the methodology for other type of uh, packing problems and also co considering other constraints. Thank you. Yes, Jose. Yes. Hi, Georgina. Very nice to see you again. Very nice to hear your talk. Um, I have a, it's a actually, it's a, a very a, a small detail, but I did not really understand what you meant by width ratio. What are you measuring with the width ratio? In the, in the several characteristics or features that you are uh, using, it was the area ratio, the, several, yes, but that, the, the last ratio. one was the width ratio. What exactly are you measuring that? I could not understand. You said that were the type of items, the diversity of the types of items, but mm. I did not get. Can you say something more about that ratio? Okay, so that's basically the ratio between the width of the strip and the dimension of the items. Uh, yeah. I'm not hearing you. You are on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So I got it. Uh, it's not really the type, but the relationship between the area of the items and the area of the large object, we'd say. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of the street. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think we're running out of time, I guess. Um, and there is no more questions as well. Okay. All right. So. Um, we now move to the last uh, presentation for um, for uh, this uh, session. So thanks for the applaud, everyone. Um, so our last speaker is uh, Michele Gaja. I hope I'm um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it right. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> we'll be speaking about the work on uh, optimization approach for complex real life uh, container loading programs. So over okay. to you, Michele. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me share my screen. So, hello everyone. My name is uh, Michele Gaida. I'm a first year PhD uh, student at the University of Lausanne. And today I want to talk to you about the, uh, this project, which is called an optimization approach for uh, a complex real life container loading problem. This is a joint work. Uh, developed together with Alessio Trivella from ETH and Anata Mancini from the University of Brescia and David Priestinger from the uh, Danish Technical University of uh, Copenhagen. So let me just introduce to you the main motivation of the project uh, goal. So this, uh, the, this project was, um, was asked by a transportation company based in, uh, in Milan, which deals in its day-to-day uh, -day, uh, business with, uh, with a lot of packing procedure and needs to load, let's say, hundreds of, uh, of containers into uh, um, 
into its uh, of course day-to-day -day transportation uh, job so these tasks are a bit time consuming for the company and they try to find a solution in the available commercial software to solve the, um, the problem but uh, some constraints were not handled properly as they as they wished so what we um, want to do with this project is to help the transition between manually taking decision to building an optimization tool in order to help the warehouse to uh, perform more, uh, more, more efficient uh, packing inside the, uh, the containers. Um, so we are dealing with a container loading problem. Uh, as, you, as you may know, it's a three-dimensional packing uh, problem, which involves filling a single container in our case. Uh, both the containers and the items are rectangular shaped and we have some basic constraints to, uh, to fulfill, such as the non-overlapping constraints, the orthogonal packing, and the normal the maximum weight. A container has a maximum bearable weight. But when we add real-life constraints to this uh, problem, the complexity heavily increases. And uh, it's, it's important also to say that this is an NP-hard problem and it's very difficult to, to solve uh, exactly. And by adding more and more um, real-life constraints, it becomes uh, even more harder to solve. So a little bit about the problem definition, um, something about the objective function, and later on I will talk about the constraints that we need to, uh, to handle. What we need to maximize in this case is called taxability, and this is defined by the company. So the company wants to maximize this value, which is called, of course, uh, taxability, and each item has a proper uh, value of uh, taxability which is the maximum between uh, its weight and the volumetric weight, which is calculated by alpha times uh, the uh, volume uh, of the item, where alpha is a constant defined by, by the law and by, by the company uh, itself. And so we want to uh, basically maximize this value, uh, even though afterwards there will be some conflicting objectives in our, uh, during our solution. So um, we have a lot of uh, practical constraints to consider in this problem. Uh, of course, we have the weight limit, we also have the weight distribution. So the company, the company divides normally the container into uh, longitudinally into four zones. And in each of these zones, we have a maximum uh, weight that we can load uh, in these zones. After the longitudinal weight distribution, we, we also need to tackle the horizontal weight distribution in which the center of mass of the, uh, of the cargo that we load inside the container must be uh, positioned into what they call the acceptance zone. Uh, other, container, other constraints are related to the multi-drop shipping, so we may have obstacles of items that uh, may be, uh, in, for example, in when we have more customers and we first need to stop to uh, deliver, for example, package one before package two. In this uh, in this figure, as you can see, um, object number two is uh, is an obstacle for object number one, considering that the unloading side is, uh, for example, here. And we want to avoid this, um, this obstacle, or at least minimize the number of obstacles of the uh, final solution. We also have some dangerous items, which are called ADR items. And these items, we must place them close to the uh, unloading point in order to be easily accessible in case of uh, accidents or, or problems. Other, other constraints are related to uh, orientation. So we are allowed to uh, rotate items, but can overturn items. So this is another constraint. And also we have loading priorities. Uh, some items due to a relationship with customers or, or businesses, we need to load them. If they have a loading priority, for example, here in the table, you can see that items with loading priority 10, they must be treated as a hard constraints. So we must provide, we must load these items in the final solution. And then we have to handle in a, in a soft way uh, the, the other values of, uh, of priority in this case. Uh, some items may be considered uh, fragile. So these items cannot, be, cannot support other items uh, on top. And so we um, ideally want to place these items uh, on top of, uh, of other items. Uh, another constraint is related to vertical stability. Uh, we need to uh, provide a sorted supported area when we place items on top of each other. And in this case, the supported area, it's provided also by, by the company, but they want the 80% of the area of the item stacked to be, um, to be handled and to be supported, let's say. So this is about the, uh, the constraint. Um, we, we propose a randomized constructive solution approach. 
And given the number of constraints to be considered uh, jointly, given the large instances with uh, hundreds of uh, strong heterogeneous items, because we do not know in advance the uh, um, some, we do not have, let's say, patterns of the items because we may have very different instances from uh, from one another. So it's really it's really hard to create patterns, and uh, we consider them to be strongly uh, heterogeneous. Uh, loading solution answers are required from the company. This was one of the most important points in the first discussion. They are required to be uh, very quickly calculated. And this was, this was one of the main points that guided our, our solution approach. And uh, therefore, we cannot, we cannot handle this course like, uh, with exact methods. And we develop a randomized uh, constructive heuristic to do that. So let me say something about our approach. We call it like, uh, it's, um, it's a multi-run approach, which can be divided into three main phases. So first of all, we have input with uh, boxes with all the characteristics, uh, dimensions and priorities and loading order, if they are dangerous or not. Uh, what we do, we first uh, sort um, the items based on some intuition, and then we use some randomization in order to perturb the, uh, the initial list. We, uh, we give this, uh, this, uh, this list to the packing procedure, we create the packing procedure, the packing solution, and then in the end, we evaluate the solution based on taxability, which is what we want to maximize, but we also need to consider the number of obstacles and, of, and also the uh, priorities. So let me just go now quickly to uh, each of these three phases and say something about, about them. So first of all, the sorting and randomization. In a, in a constructive uh, approach like, like this one, Sorting highly influences the packing process. So we, we try to generate promising orderings in the, in the beginning uh, based on different intuitions. For example, we can, we can group items based on priority and inside each group, we can, um, we can sort the items based on taxability. We can either group items based on unloading priority and then uh, sort inside, uh, inside each group. Uh, the sort of list is then uh, perturbed. We can use uh, the rotation as a sort of uh, perturbation to the, to, the, to the list. We can maybe we can also swap position of two consecutive uh, items if their volume has a certain degree of, uh, of similarity, and so on. We can we also uh, describe some some other functions uh, based on taxability, and um, and therefore we are able to uh, sort of create a perturbation into the list, and this gives us the possibility to. Uh, explore a wider uh, range of, uh, of solutions. The constructive packing, uh, so receiving the, the list of the items that we sorted and uh, randomized, the, um, the packing procedure is uh, done sequentially following the list. And um, initially, of course, the container is considered to be empty and we have some uh, candidate locations in which we can place uh, the items. These candidate locations, are, I call them, I mean, we call them in literature <coughs> potential positions or, or points, which are very similar to what uh, Mr. Olson uh, presented before. In this example, you see that when, when, the, uh, when the container is empty, uh, we create these four potential points. So one on the front side, the left, one, one on the front side, the right. And these other two, they are different from the others because these, these are, um, let's say, special potential points for the dangerous items because this is the, uh, the unloading point, the unloading side of, uh, of the container. And while we create our, our, while we place the first item, we create new points and, and so on. Of course, when, when there's a stacking item, we, uh, we, we project and we create also another, another potential point that may be uh, useful. And when we, when we decide in which position to, to place the, the item or if we can position an item in a certain potential point, we have to consider the zone weight feasibility, as I, as I explained before, the stackability constraint, the stability, and also if the item is or not considered to be dangerous and therefore to be placed in the, uh, in the spatial potential points. So uh, just a little example about, um, about uh, simple logic, uh, how we choose the potential, uh, the potential points. So we try to build our solution from the front side of the, of the container to the rear side. In this case, uh, we need to uh, place this uh, green item. And from these two potential points, we decided to place it here because it's the potential point in which this item occupies the most of the, uh, of the area allowed by this, uh, by this point. 
Uh, during the evaluation of the solution, um, we need to consider three criteria mainly. So we need to consider the taxability, the number of unloading uh, obstacles, and also the cumulative uh, priority. Since the, this may sound like a conflicting uh, objective somehow, we decided to discard the Pareto-dominated uh, solution with respect to these uh, uh, three, uh, three objectives. And um, to say, to, to, to bring now to some uh, results, let me introduce the setting of the numerical study. So here we have the dimensions of the most used container. Um, I mean, this is not something static. We can, we can change the input of the algorithm because the company uses uh, different uh, bands and different uh, containers. And um, this is just, uh, just the setting um, in which we uh, tested the algorithm because it's the most common. So we have the maximum weight and also we have the, the stacking stability supported area, which is also an input, and we decided it to be the 80% of the uh, stacked item. Uh, some results. So we tested the algorithm in uh, 38 real uh, instances given from, uh, from the company, and we had also the uh, results of, uh, of the company, so how the company was able to uh, load this, uh, this list. But from the company results, we only know if an item was loaded or not, so we are not able to assess all the constraints if we're respected or not. We allow our algorithm to perform 500 iterations and considering all the 38 uh, instances, we improve the taxability by 2.4%. Uh, spoiler alert, this is going to increase because now we are uh, revisioning our algorithm and, um, and some improvement were made, but just uh, keep in mind that this is the, uh, the data that we first, uh, in which we first uh, tested the first version of the uh, of the algorithm. Analyzing the company results, so as I said, we do not know the position uh, in which the company was able to place the items inside their, their solutions, but analyzing the, the total number of items loaded, we, we observed that in nine instances, the company solution does not respect the maximum uh, weight constraint, which is something we can calculate, right? Even just having the, uh, the list of, uh, of items. And if we remove these uh, infeasible uh, solutions, our, our algorithm uh, performs, um, I mean, improves by 20% in the remaining, uh, in the remaining instances. And uh, this, is, this is also important, this aspect of infeasibility here, because one of the main problems sometimes is, uh, is the fines that uh, a company may receive if you do not load properly the uh, items inside your container. And uh, just to say something about the running time of the algorithm, um, the running time for 500 iterations, it's, by, it's around uh, 7.6 uh, seconds. So just to uh, highlight some key aspects. So here you can see the effect of randomization. The dashed line, the really uh, light dashed line here, is the result obtained by ordering the list based on taxability, so based on profit. And as you can see, if, you, if we order the, the, uh, the list based on taxability, uh, we are able to, to get a good result. And by randomizing, we get a lot of uh, worse uh, result comparing to this one. But on the long run, we get better results. And here on the right, you can see the improvement um, based on the number of, uh, of iterations. And after uh, less than 750 uh, iterations, we get uh, the, our best result in, in, in this case. So in this case, we allowed 1,000 iterations. And to evaluate the solution, you see um, on the left side here, the, uh, the Pareto frontier based on taxability and number of obstacles. And based on this result, we decided not to output only one result to the, to the warehouse, but to give them a 3D representation of uh, some results, five or six uh, solutions. Because in this case, you may prefer as a, as a warehouse person to, to, to choose one of these solutions, even if the taxability is not the best, because you reduce the number of obstacles so that you can save time during the loading side and the unloading um, phase. And this is about the cumulative priority uh, and the taxability. We can see the, the, the dominating frontier here. Uh, some other aspects that is interesting. So I tested uh, in, this, um, in this instance that I'm showing to you right now, I tested the algorithm against one of the most used uh, commercial, so commercial uh, softwares, which is EasyCargo. And I tested the same solution. Here we can see that our alternation approach, so building from the left and also from the, the right, gives a better distribution of, of packages. And also considering this instance, our algorithm perform 4.2% uh, better, better than, uh, than the commercial software, which is good. 
And in conclusion, we, we studied this um, real life container loading problem and we proposed a solution to the, uh, to the company, which is now working on the uh, concrete implementation into its day-to-day uh, -day, uh, business. And uh, the solution approach, approach has been uh, positively welcomed from, uh, from the company. And, um, and yeah, I mean, uh, considering this uh, real, life, um, real life container loading problem is very useful for them because one, the feasibility is uh, really important because it ensures the company not to get fines if you choose to go with, uh, with this approach and also improve the, um, on the long run, you improve the efficiency of your, of your loading, um, loading container. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want to read the first version of the paper, you can find it in uh, this link. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, thanks so much, Michele, for the great talk. Any questions from the audience? Yes, Roman? Uh, yes. <clears throat> very nice presentation, Michael. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and do you, did you mention that uh, there is several customers served by the same container? So the, the order in which the customers are visited is given? Yes. Yeah, and, it's already uh, OK. And in your problem, they have many clients in the same container, so uh, very few boxes for each uh, customer or a long number of uh, boxes for each customer? Uh, it, it varies a lot. Sometimes you, you also have like uh, only one customer, which is very good because you don't have to handle with this constraint. But sometimes mm -hmm. you may also have, I don't know, seven, eight different customers in the, in the tests I have now. But uh, in the first discussion with the company, uh, they told us that they want this to be considered like, um, like a normal constraint. So you don't have to care about the number of, uh, of customers because it may be way easier if you know how many customers you have because maybe you can pack them into a greater um, hmm. packing structures and build a more, a more let's say, convenient uh, structure. But in this case, we do not know it in advance. And mm -hmm. also sometimes it's very, it's very hard to, because sometimes the customers, they have uh, different size boxes. So you, you don't have the same typology of box for a customer. So you cannot uh, build, let's say, let's say, patterns based on customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Jorge, yeah. You are mute, you're mute, maybe. Hi. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I was wondering about the dangerous good constraint, how you implemented it. Is it a hard constraint, so nothing can be between the dangerous goods and the door? Or is it a soft constraint, so you try to place it as close to the door as possible? No, this is a, this is a hard constraint. And in this case, uh, on uh, based on how we generate the, uh, based on the characteristic of the of the container, because some, sometimes you have the unloading side only on the back, but sometimes you can open and access the container also from the right side or the left side. It depends on the container. So depending on the container, uh, I create uh, in a different way the uh, potential point to be used for these kind of items. And between these items and the, um, the unloading side, so the accessible side, you cannot put other items. So it's, it's treated like a hard constraint in this case. Okay. All right, the last question is from uh, Jonas. Oh, thank you for a really nice uh, presentation. Uh, so I have two questions. So, so one is um, with the placement points. So, so given that you have the next uh, box to place, you said that you use the um, available space as a way to see which w where to place it. Um, so I was just wondering if you tried any other methods of deciding which placement point uh, to use for the next placement. Uh, and the second question is about um, stacking constraints, how, how, you, uh, how you model those. So um, the, the potential points, we normally, so since we want the, the, uh, the, the process to be very quick, this was the most immediate, let's say, uh, way to, uh, to assess them and to, to build um, a stable, a stable uh, procedure, a stable stacking procedure. And uh, what I tried is to order them differently. So to make the algorithm treat them uh, based on different order. So maybe I wanted first to, um, to load uh, boxes on the front side and then go back. But sometimes what I, what I tried was also to 
to uh, feel all the, um, let's say, the, the, uh, the low side of the container, the pavement, and then go, go up. But in this case, you don't know if, if you, you are going to, uh, to get items that are fragile and maybe you, uh, you end up with a not, not so efficient uh, packing. So this was uh, one thing that I wanted to, to, that I tried. But what I wanted to try is to consider some more complicated uh, things like um, not consider only the support area that you have, but if you can extend this support area by another item and then right. decided to place that in that, in that case. So this is what uh, I would like to try now because it's, uh, it's something that I didn't try to be honest. And the last question was about... Uh, the stacking constraints. Yes, how I model them. Yeah. So again, I just um, I just want my my box to um, to be supported at least for eighty percent. So just uh, like that, not uh, nothing very very specific. Okay, I, th I think about the weight you can put on top of a box. Was you had something about the fragile or non fragile? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So about the fragile. So if an item is fragile, I tend to treat it later on in the list. Okay. So I don't, I don't have to care about the, um, the stacking in the beginning. And, um, and also, yeah, uh, it's, it's about the sorting mainly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, Michele. Thank and you. thanks, everyone. That's the end of this second session. So take a 10 minutes break and come back in half past.